we entered the year 2022 with peak liquidity, peak valuations, and peak earnings. So I, I think the bulk of the valuation correction has probably been had. Uh, and I think the liquidity backdrop has clearly changed. Um, and, and, and going through that negative revision cycle should be the kind of the final phase of this uh, you know, correction. It just, it, it could take some time for it to play out. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On The Margin. Today, I'm joined by repeat guest, Mr. Blonde. Mr. Blonde, welcome back to the show. Great. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. Um, just for, for context for the audience, I want to talk about this idea of recession, right? The big R word that people are focused on. I want to talk about how that translates into earnings, uh, corporate earnings, let's say for the next couple of quarters. Uh, and then I want to close with housing, which I know you've talked a lot about and you have some very specific thoughts on. Uh, let's start with what we're looking at here, which is the U.S. recession risk index aggregate. So can you talk to us about um, what like what goes into this chart exactly um, and whether or not you, how did this informs your view of you know, the risk of recession. Sure. Well, you know, let me say up front, I, I can't take credit for um, this chart. This belongs to Nancy Lazar uh, and mm. Piper Sandler. Um, but I, I've followed Nancy's work for a long time and, uh, and, and, and put it in the, in the high quality bucket. I, mean, I think like most recession indicators, this indicator includes various leading indicators and or market measures that often precede or preclude or forecast uh, stress in in the economy, uh, things like ISM new orders, uh, the you know shapes the yield curve, uh, the tightening of financial conditions, strength in the dollar, all of these things, you know, credit spreads, um, things of that nature that would you know tighten financial conditions. Tighter financial conditions often lead to lower, slower growth, uh, and at some point, you know, potentially um, negative growth or negative growth in certain pockets. And the reason I shared this chart, you know, in a recent post is is really to just kind of highlight. That the the data is already kind of telling us that the odds of a recession are pretty high. So I mean, a few months ago, uh, or at the start of this year, this was a this was this was a low probability sort of outcome on the part of market participants, and and now it's it certainly has risen you know quite a bit. Uh, Nancy's indicator is a touch north of sixty percent, and you can see from the chart that historically, whenever it's gotten to at least sixty percent, there has been a recession. Uh, you know, in in the subsequent you know uh, in the subsequent period. So I I do think that um, and it's not to say that markets have not contemplated this, but sixty percent means that there's still forty percent to go. So how do you kind of think about um, this period of recession within the context of earnings? Let's say for the next year. So we're looking yeah. at uh, here for folks who are just listening along. We're looking at um, S and P five hundred upwards revisions as a percentage of uh, the total, right? So mm -hmm. even you know late last year, right, there was an enormous amount of upward revision so that were going on that has severely dropped off in the last couple of months. So how do you kind of think about us being in this period of economic contraction, recession? How does that kind of flow through and translate into corporate earnings? Um, I, you know, I, I penned a note on this a couple, uh, I guess about a month ago, uh, that has more data. But when you look at historically at earnings drawdowns during recessions, I mean, the typical EPS drawdown is is somewhere in the neighborhood of fifteen to twenty percent, uh, which is is pretty material. Um, you know, profit decline. I think one of the important things to to keep in mind with this cycle, um, in particular, is we also are starting this recession or starting this you know significant growth slowdown at a time when profits are well above trend. So mm -hmm. you're 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 more vulnerable in that sense uh, because there's been a you know a, a strong period of over earning. And I think that's a, that's an important caveat, and and obviously that's part of why revisions have already been uh, weaker uh, and have started to turn negative because the starting point is uh, also pretty um, uh, pretty high, right? So we're talking about economic activity here, like earnings. How do you see this translating into? equity prices, right? Because if you look at the way equities are priced, there are kind of two components there, right? There's the valuation component that they get on their earnings, and then there's the actual earnings themselves. I think you could make a pretty strong argument that most of the negative price action that we've been seeing in equities thus far has simply been an adjustment in terms of that first component, right? The valuation part of the, of the, you know, of the formula. But now, right, if, if what we're projecting here is a is downward earnings, right, yeah. um, then I think there should be right another leg down in equities. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I, I do tend to agree. I, I would. Um, here's the, how I've sort of framed it. I think we entered we entered the year 2022 with peak liquidity, 
peak valuations and peak earnings, mm. right? When you think about sort of Fed policy, negative real rates, at, you know, at the, at the start of the year, valuations were at generational highs. Uh, and, and as I said, earnings were way, way above trend. Um, I think we've, as you said, as you suggest, I think we've made good progress on the first of those, you, the first two of those three issues in that valuations have come off. I mean, we've come from, you'll call it, you know, roughly 22 times forward to 16 times forward. I think we're 15, you know, 15 times forward in, in, in June. So I, I think the bulk of the valuation correction has probably been had. Um, of course, there are, there are scenarios where it can go more, but I'm just saying the bulk of it has probably been has probably been had, uh, and I think the liquidity backdrop has clearly changed. I mean, the Fed has aggressively hiked, uh, and the market has priced in more hikes, uh, and you know we're doing QT, and so the liquidity backdrop has clearly changed and is quite different from what it was late last year. Uh, and so the third issue to resolve is peak earnings. Um, and you know, I think the, the challenge with earnings is that I mean, I guess it's both a good and a bad. The earnings correction will generally be slower, right? Because it takes time for that to pass through. It takes time for realization of a profit declines. It, you, you only get sort of four updates a year from, you know, from companies and corporates about uh, business and, and, and analyst community generally is, you know, works at a slower pace than, you know, something like a 75 basis point rate hike at a Fed meeting has a very immediate, direct, you know, kind of slap you in the face impact. Um, you know, I call the the rev, you know, negative revision cycles like death by paper cuts, right? You just kind of keep getting you know cut a little bit at a, at a time, uh, and so that part will be slower in its in the realization of it. It doesn't mean that the market will will react slower to it. It just means that the process um, I think gets drawn out and and will sort of take place over a few quarters as opposed to you know being able to happen uh, in a couple months. So mm-hmm. I agree. I think that's the next leg. Uh, and I think if we wanted to be a little bit optimistic, we would say that you know the earnings, uh, you're correcting the your earnings expectations um, and 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 going through that negative revision cycle should be the kind of the final phase of this uh, you know correction. It just it it could take some time for it to play out. I think that that timing part is always what's really difficult to nail, isn't it? And, yeah. you know, one, um, we talked about this, I, this is just a striking point. Uh, I brought up, brought this up with an interview that did, we did with Len Alden recently, but um, it was a great interview. Did you happen to catch the interview between John Collison and Stan Druckenmiller? Uh, I did. Yeah. He made a, he made a really interesting point um, because I, what I want to get an understanding of here is, you know, how corporate earnings, how that interfaces with some of these other big moves that we're seeing on a more macro level, right? So uh, rising energy prices, a very strong dollar and rising rates, right? Um, so there was, there was, there was a really interesting, uh, Stan was talking about a period of time around 2000, 2001, mm-hmm. he was kind of describing this way that he was getting whipsawed, right? Because that at that time you had, um, the dot com bubble that was happening, right? And he, you know, kind of famously, uh, you know, struggled with it a little bit. You know, he kind of put money in, got a little bit, you know, put a lot of money in at exactly the wrong time. Uh, he took a break, but then he kind of came back and, and looked at markets. And there was uh, the setup was you had rising energy costs, you had a strong dollar, uh, and you had rising yields. Um, uh, but, but the price of equities were still elevated. Um, and so he, I, he talked, he kind of farmed it out to a friend of his, but, uh, they did some, um, some regressions and they came, they, they, what they projected was when you had that scenario, that setup, rising energy costs, strong dollar, rising yields, which should sound really, really familiar with what's going on today. Uh, typically earnings contracted by 35% the next year. So I don't know if you read that or if you heard something similar, but I mean, what, what did you think about that particular tidbit? I would also add to the to the three to the dollar to rates and energy is, is credit spreads um, is also mm. a pretty important um, uh, metric. And, and you can see it as well in things like ISM new orders, which uh, or the you know, new orders inventory uh, ratio, which also gives you a, a pretty good indication of of future growth. So I, I, I completely agree. I think the writing was already, you know, in the cards. Um, and now over the course of the next couple of quarters, we have to realize that. And I think that that's, and we have to digest that. And that's what, um, I think that that's what drives the next, you know, kind of quote unquote, big leg lower in, in, in equity markets is we have to kind of reset the deck, reset expectations, um, you know, particularly on 2023 EPS, uh, but also probably on the second half of, of 2022. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for those of you who are, who are kind of following along here, we're looking at uh, 2022 uh, and 2023 expected uh, consensus earnings, right? This is indexed from uh, October 29th, 2021. So uh, I, I want to actually also, because you kind of break it out here, um, earnings and then X energy earnings, right? So yep. energy, it really looks like based on these charts, both uh, certainly for 2022, uh, but also for 2023 is really carrying uh, things in general. Uh, you've also got a great chart here um, where you kind of break out different segments of the S&P 500. Um, basically, you know, from the high level here, it looks like we're looking at a sea of red. But, you know, walk me through any, anything that stands out to you here. Um, maybe let's get your perspective on energy uh, and then anything else that you think uh, investors should be aware of. Yeah, look, you're absolutely right. I mean, in the last, let's call it in the last three or f- you know, three months or so, three or four months, energy has been the dominant factor kind of holding up uh, forward earnings, right? So yeah. it's a it's a relatively small weight in the index. It you know kind of you know just under ten percent, uh, but the magnitude of the moves has has you know has been high, and the magnitude of growth is high. So it's punching above its weight, so to speak. Um, I think that that's obviously set to change a little bit. I mean, you don't have a thirty percent fall in oil price, and 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 have analysts keep their. Uh, their energy sector earnings forecast the same. These tend to be very highly correlated, at least the momentum. So I think that that's one important dynamic from here and could be an important aspect of, of what um, ends up becoming a, you know, a driving 2023 expectations or, you know, second half of 2022 expectations lower. And that one area that was clearly a source of strength and holding up the index level falls off. Uh, and then mm-hmm. you realize that everything else is also weak. Uh, and so, you know, it can it can kind of move um, it can move pretty quickly. So, I do think that that's an important dynamic here. And 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 you know, the, I, I'll I'll sort of you know, quick sidebar. I mean, I think this is an important part you know for the market overall. I mean, a couple months ago, there was a lot more talk about capitulation and whether we had met the low in the markets, right? And you know, I, I have my own capitulation indicator, which which I've shared. I think one of the important dynamics of the last. Uh, two months, really, you know, kind of June and into July here is that the the correction has broadened out. So now that it's included consumer staples, it's included energy, you know, another leg lower in the market that you know, it will be broader. And and actually, it starts to look more like capitulation because there's there really there really is no place to hide uh, kind of environment. Um, and that and, and to your point, this is what you see on the revisions chart as well. I mean, you look at estimates for either the second quarter or for, you know, 2022 or 2023 over the past month, uh, there's not really any place there that is showing you any upward revision. So um, it's it's pretty broad uh, yeah. reset of expectations. I, I also, you know, I, I want to get a sense here as well of how you think these numbers kind of, we're obviously talking about here about end of 2022, 2023 expectations, but I want to get your sense of how those fold into some broader macro trends. Like I, I, I'm going to caveat this by saying, right, I'm not an energy, or I'm not an expert on energy globally, right? I'm not a geopolitical expert. But when I kind of look out into the world and big trends that could impact earnings, I'm seeing some trends that are not super friendly towards either corporate profits or valuations in general, right? I think stickier CPI than normal, maybe the Fed really cranks up interest rates and defeats this inflation beast. I have a lot of doubt that that's possible, right? In an, in an, era, in an environment where we have uh, sustained inflation, I just don't think you're going to see those rock bottom interest rates that we've had, you know, previously, right? So the liquidity environment, I think, is very changed. I also, I mean, if you look at how dist- um, disturbing this geopolitical situation going on over in Russia, between Russia and Ukraine has been to energy, but also just to geopolitical structure, right? I think it's been massively disturbing, obviously, that the input cost of energy has a direct translation into corporate earnings, but also just this idea of not being able to borrow from low cost labor pools has an, an, has an enormous impact on uh, corporate profits moving forward. So when you kind of match up some of these shorter term, uh, you know, inputs versus how you see them folding into longer term trends, I mean, do is the next decade, do you think, is it going to be as strong for corporate earnings as capital friendly as it's been? Or do you kind of see this like, you know, uh, some big structural headwinds uh, for equities moving forward? Yeah, I, I think when you frame it that way, you would suggest no, it's going to be a challenge, right? I mean, there's sort of the unwind <laughs> so of, of no, yeah, yeah, but I, and, and and look, I think they're all fair points. I mean, they're all clearly mm-hmm. sort of front and center issues. Um, I, I guess I would make a, a, a couple quick kind of comments. I mean, I think when I think of rates, I think of valuation. I don't necessarily think yep. of earnings, and when I think of geopolitics, 
um, I tend to think of evaluation or some kind of you know risk premium uh, or expected volatility. I don't necessarily think of earnings, right? And it doesn't mean that geopolitics can't affect earnings, right? There's knock on effects uh, that that can do that. But those two things strike me as being more valuation uh, drivers than they are clear earnings drivers. And it doesn't, you know, like I said, it doesn't mean that they they can't manifest themselves into earnings. But the um, the relationship is a little bit fuzzier. But the geopolitical backdrop, you know, as it pertains to higher input costs uh, or frictions in supply chain, things of that nature, uh, certainly lends itself to expect lower margins uh, in, you know, meaningful parts of the market as, as companies need to, you know, they need supply chain diversification, which is code for we're going to have to spend more money to make sure that we have, you know, just in case inventory or, or whatever, whatever that might be. No longer can they place all of their exposure uh, or produce all of their um, goods in the, in the place that has the cheapest labor. They have to make other decisions, right? It's a risk award. So I, I do, and, and mar- lower margins, all else equal, would also point to lower valuations, right? I mean, I think that's kind of, that's the, that's the you know, connection. Um, so I, look, I, I generally agree with that. I guess where, where I take a step back is, man, making sort of 10-year forecasts um, is tough, right? Because you know history has shown that at least U.S. corporates, anyway, have have proven to be pretty resilient, uh, mm-hmm. and they find ways to make money, right? I mean, you know, their your CEOs. Uh, this is the one thing that I think is a little bit unique about the U.S. in particular, and maybe less so, um, certainly less so in EM, uh, and less so in Europe and Japan, which is corporate CEOs in the U.S. are aligned with shareholders. They get paid if their stock price goes up. It's plain and simple. And so they find ways um, to navigate difficult environments in order to drive you know stock price higher. I know that there's going to be a lot of people who are skeptical about buybacks and things of that nature. The reality is, is in most cases, buybacks are a function of companies that are over earning and have excess capital. And that's what drives the buyback, not you know some sinister you know you know or um, smaller sample size of you know, kind of leverage buybacks. Of course, that happens in in pockets too. But in most cases, buybacks are being driven by companies that have high free cash flow margin uh, and just happen to have um, excess profits. You know, as a function of of good business model. So, look, I, I, it would be naive, I think, to dismiss you know some of the important changes. I, I don't personally put a lot of weight on ten year forecasts because that's not how I trade. You know, my own capital. I, I tend to think of my 10 year view is a series of 12 month views. Um, and, you know, if I get those 12 month views right um, in succession, then 10 years from now, I'll, I'll have done very well <laughs> as opposed to, you know, kind of, you know, placing a 10 year view uh, and then, you know, holding that, you know, for 10 years. I, I think that's a little bit harder. I, you know, certainly, um, you know, aware of, of issues. I, I just think it's, I don't find it to be a, a, an effective way to sort of make money in the time horizon that, that most of us care about. But yes, for sure. Right now, we have a situation where a lot of those secular issues are pointing down. Um, I think more importantly, the cyclical um, growth environment is pointing down. And I think that will be the dominant factor um, over the course of the next six to 12 months. I want to transition into something that you said um, just about uh, credit spreads in general. So that the last like kind of health of uh, fixed income here, because obviously many many investors want to know uh, how Fed policy translates into the stock market. But um, I think we know that they pay more attention to what's going on in fixed income and specifically the treasuries market in general. Uh, so one development that's been I think relatively concerning, right? We know that in March of 2020, they had their alphabet soup of different, uh, you know, programs, and they really stepped into the market in a big way and really, uh, you know, kind of launched QE infinity uh, and the infinite bid um, was because there was a freezing up in the treasuries market in general. Um, so I'd be curious, like how you and, and right now we've seen we have we certainly haven't seen a freezing up of the treasuries market, but liquidity is thinned, right? The move index has kind of started to move higher. We're starting to see spreads not blow out, but they're certainly starting to widen. So what's your kind of assessment of how important uh, what, what's your kind of assessment of the current state? Um, right. Uh, in terms of just how tight things are getting in, in the credit market and where you think where you expect it to go. Yeah, look, I mean, I think. Um, well, I'll, I'll separate treasuries from credit. Um, on treasuries, I think a lot of the volatility is a function of the the largest buyer um, is, is now a seller, and that's the Fed, right? I mean, largest buyer in the sense of you know rate setting policy as well as uh, quantitative easing, and so um, 
they've changed their behavior and they're now, you know, kind of myopically focused on inflation. That's, you know, that that's their focus and that's their goal. And as long as that's an issue, then I think rate vol will stay high because it, it, it presents a high degree of uncertainty. Um, inflation is very difficult to forecast. I mean, both for the private sector as well as for the Fed, clearly, right? So, I mean, that's kind of mm-hmm. part of why we are where we are and, and also why um, historically it's best to kind of, you know, keep that inflation genie in the bottle because, it's it's difficult to um, get it get a handle on both in terms of you know your expectations as well as maybe how you how you put it back in the bottle on credit I think of credit spreads as being driven more by expected growth um, obviously there's a policy element as well because you know and, and particularly in the last you know ten years because of Fed or central bank policy in general has resulted in a lot of sort of reaching for risk as you move out the risk curve because you weren't being compensated to take uh you know risk in in treasuries and so you move you move further out and and credit is closest to that um that you know pocket of the market and so you're more 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 f- directly affected but credit is also you're pretty clearly affected by rate of change of growth i mean i've i've shared a chart in the past um, and I can pass it on to you uh, for the for the podcast. But if you if you look at ISM new orders or sort of ISM uh, and the relationship with credit spreads, they're very clear in that when ISM is falling, credit spreads you know, typically are rising, uh, and that seems to be the case this cycle as well. Obviously, that's you know all stems from a function of future growth, future profitability of corporates, and the risk premium associated with taking credit risk. Credit risk. Being somewhat unique or more unique than equities, in that you kind of have one-sided risk. You're you're effectively selling puts. So when when the growth environment is weak and or you have a, a central bank that's tightening, um, tightening, you're not really compensated to sell that put. I mean, quite the opposite. You you know, you're 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 better off um, you know, in theory and other assets uh, until those headwinds uh, subside. So I think credit will continue to widen. Um, spreads will continue to widen. I think that you know one thing at, for me anyway at the margin that's changed maybe since the last time we spoke is I, I do think that we're probably at a point in the cycle where and I, I wrote a you know the theme that I kind of wrote about was that we move from Fed hikes to growth cuts, um, and you, I think you can see that taking place you know in in different pockets of the market. But at this point, you know financial conditions tightenings have has moved quite a bit. Um, it's not to say that the Fed won't continue to hike. Maybe they have to hike more because of inflation or whatnot. But I think the market um, focus shifts towards the impact of that financial conditions tightening. Um, and and that can potentially uh, obviously result in, uh, you know, more, you know, curve um, inversion. Uh, and I think at least at the at the kind of the longer end of the curve, let's call it, you know, kind of 10 years uh, and beyond, you know, um, some stabilization, you know, or you know, even potentially, you know, yields coming down as the market is thinking about what happens on the other side of this rate hike cycle. One thing that I'd love to, to sort of get your opinion on just in terms of what the market is pricing in, in terms of rates, right? Even while, you know, there's the there's the nine handle CPI print that we just got. Um, and there's general, you know, hawkishness being priced in. At the same time, uh, if you look at the futures Fed fund rates out, you know, passing 2023, the market is actually pricing in the Fed cutting in general. And that kind of stands, you know, there's a really, there's a great blog post by Dario Perkins, uh, which I saw you, you sort of commented on, which is kind of what is the Fed most afraid of, right? What's the Fed's greatest fear? And it covered a pretty interesting political element to all this, right? Because recessions kind of happen and nobody likes them, but everyone accepts that they do happen. But the whole reason, the atre or whatever he said, the whole reason why the Fed exists is to avoid a 1970s style inflation. So those two things, right? Like the kind of political human element of this and what markets are pricing in are kind of saying different things. How do you see all this kind of shaking out? Yeah, I mean it's um, it's uh, it's tricky. I mean, I think I, I I guess kind of going back to what I just said I, on the Fed, I think they had a choice to go early and slow and be more mm-hmm. prospective in their thinking and recognize that markets had largely healed in 2020. The market view was different than the political view or the policy view about where growth was headed in the late you know in late 2020. Not to you. Like, too deep into this, but in my personal opinion, I think the Fed should have started the the process of unwinding extraordinary policy after we got a vaccine. 
I mean, I think that was that was a key sort of turning point in the whole COVID related um, saga that would have said, okay, at this point where markets are are functioning and we should let markets function. And maybe for them at that point, that was really just about unwinding or or backing off of balance sheet and, and quantitative easing, giving them the capacity to hike rates later in 2021, if that's what they felt like they needed to do. Um, but because of the way that the hole that they dug, it was it was hard to dig out. But all that being said, I, I think, again, you know, what we're dealing with today is a function of you know one bad decision leads to another bad decision. And it's a series Right. I mean, they, they kind of compound on themselves. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's a tricky spot to get out of. And it's, it's hard to get ahead of. Um, and, and markets are, will always be faster than policy makers. Right. I mean, markets are instantaneous when it comes to these events and policymakers. They, they kind of have their institutional framework. They have to check with the research staff. It just right. is a little bit slower moving. And so I think. What's happening is the market, you know, it now has its teeth, you know, teeth sunk in, and is saying that you know until, um, you know, this until the sort of inflation, you know, kind of dynamic breaks, we're going to keep kind of pushing you in this direction, and it, and and I think, I guess my interpretation of the market is, it says that yeah, we we know that you're going to have to hike and, and crush this, but the cost of waiting too long or the cost of going later and slower, I mean, sorry, later and faster will basically be a recession. And as a result, um, you know, we kind of see the the flip side of or the, the back side of the boom bust cycle. So we had the boom. Now we have sort of a bust as things break down um, and that, you know, results in recession. And typically in recessions, the Fed is cutting. And I think that that's what the market is saying. So, I mean, you could interpret market pricing as being you know, kind of a quote unquote, this is a policy error and that they're hiking today only to have to cut quickly later. I think if you look at history, uh, certainly in the 70s and 80s, um, which is a you know time period that many are citing today, I mean, interest rate volatility and front end rates were very volatile. There were plenty of times where they hiked a lot and within six months or less, they were cutting you know pretty dramatically. Um, whether that was the right policy or not is, I don't think is for is to debate. It's that's just the reality of how they were trying to manage the economic cycle at the time. Yeah, I, I guess one of my frameworks, um, you know, looking at it over the next decade is that you know in the last uh, for the last twenty or so years, right, basically since the dot com bust. All right, maybe let me just use the last uh, ten or so year period since the great financial crisis. Um, there have been these incredibly positive tailwinds, especially for equities, but really all financial assets in general, because um, the Fed was trying to stimulate growth and they had uh, very low inflation, right? So you had this environment where even though there were these, you know, periodic corrections, you really had this like buy the dip mentality, right? Um, now you almost have that in reverse, right? Because you have, you've, you've got a low growth environment, but you've also have inflation, right? Which is putting a, a floor on how, on how low the Fed can can bring interest rates. Um, so it's just, it's tough to see and understand who that next marginal buyer is going to be, uh, who's going to step in, especially for, for treasuries. Um, and you also just don't have that same, that same floor that you, that investors have come to expect. So it seems like we're in this transitionary period right now of buy every dip to sell every rip. Right. And that's not to say that there won't be periodic, um, you know, corrections, you know, in bull, bullish corrections. But overall, it's just really hard to find. And I think that's what the market is looking for, that it just can't seem to find is positive catalysts. Do you do you agree with that? Yeah, no, I do. I do agree with that. I, I think I, I would say um, I think the period that you described was, you know, kind of I mean, obviously we had you know, recessions and, you know, 2000, 2008. But I mean, it, it kind of really stems from like the Greenspan era, right? Or the late 1980s, we went through this long period of like great moderation, these elongated, you know, calm business cycles. Um, but when you look at business cycles pre-1990, I mean, they were pretty volatile, right? I mean, you had you, you had more macro volatility, I mean, akin to what you, I think a little bit of what you're describing today. I mean, some of it stems from inflation, some of it ex stemmed from the style um, economy that we had at the time, which was more sort of inventory cycle driven, which I think is a pretty important part of, of this cycle as well. Um, and, and that economic volatility you, you know, creates a little bit more of a boom bust environment and you have shorter cycles, the, the, the cycles tend to be um, you know, a little bit more um, uh, voracious in their style, meaning like you, know, you kind of you know you go up fast, you come down fast. Um, maybe it doesn't it doesn't end up 
um, impacting all sectors of the market equally, but you know, um, or all sectors of the economy equally, or it just it it just creates a little bit more um, up and down. And obviously, you know, volatility is the antithesis of um, you know valuations and and liquidity, you know, and right and other things. So I think that that's you know part of what you're saying is that your know, higher vol environment, all else equal, you know, would suggest that you should command a higher risk premium for taking risk because you're going to have to stomach and deal with these periodic um, asset price shocks, which could either be a function of policy driven decisions, i.e., in reaction or response to inflation or some of those changing dynamics, um, or volatility stems from um, growth volatility, and that mm. you know you have you know a, a more um, uh, you, know, you, you know more significant you know, kind of inventory you know uh, correct you know restocking destocking cycles. Um, so I, I subscribe to that. I think that makes sense. I mean, I think that this is where you know you probably have seen some of the work that people you know have posted. and They talk about you know returns from here will be low, right? Um, right. right? I I, yeah. I don't disagree with that. I think that that's all the more reason that we need to pay attention to what's happening in the cyclical time horizon. Uh, because if you're going to make money and you're going to out earn those low returns, uh, then you have to be willing to um, best as, as you can be intellectually flexible and trade the cycle a little bit more, right? So when things are when when things are at your back, you're willing to be long. And when things are uh, represent headwinds that you're, um, you know, you have pretty significant risk reduction. So a little bit more market timing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe like to, to move into this, this the last phase of this, um, the last big bucket, I think, that we haven't really talked about yet, which is just housing in general. I mean, it's enormous, um, you know, it has an enormous impact on the U.S. economy, A, just in terms of the, the number of people in the United States that hold their wealth um, in, let's say, the residential real estate sector and the percentage of their wealth that they hold um, in, the, in the real estate sector. Uh, and then also how housing in general, the growth of housing, how that kind of ripples out into the economy. So maybe let's start just from like a 10,000 foot view of that, uh, because we have, you know, as in, as interest rates have moved up, right, that's had a big, big impact on like the price of a 30 year mortgage. So I guess my question to you is like, how do you think about housing and its importance in the U.S. economy just to start with? Yeah. So I look, I mean, I, I subscribe to the um, Ed Lerner paper, you know, housing is the business cycle. I mean, it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a big part of the economy. It has a large multiplier effect. Um, it, it obviously is a big part of financial markets. Um, so yeah, it touches everything. Uh, and, and not to, and, you know, on top of the fact that it's a big portion of, you know, to your point, um, household wealth. Um, it also is, one of the most interest rate sensitive sectors in the market, maybe you know autos, you know being another one. Um, so I, I, this was you know kind of behind you know my thesis at the start of the year to you know, or near the start of the year to short home builders. You know when when rates started going up, it's it's not a function of I mean a lot of people focus on uh, inventory levels and and and, and whatnot. It just it it sort of doesn't matter, right? I mean it, if if rates are going up as fast as they are, it will curtail demand. It will sort of the marginal buyer goes away quickly because it becomes too you know prohibitively expensive to transact, and if you don't have new buyers, you don't have new activity, then that gums up the system. I mean, the other thing that happens that I think, um, and like, look, I'm no housing expert. There are plenty of other people on on social media who are more well versed than I am, but I just I think about it from you know as a homeowner and sort of a rational person. Right. I mean, if you have an existing mortgage and it has a two handle. And now the running you know rate on mortgages has a four handle or a five handle. How likely are you to move <laughs> away from your you know um, well financed you know cheap you know um, cost of carry asset? And then you know you think about it on top of how some of the market structures changed around where people can work from. I mean the willingness to for, for corporates to allow people to work from home. It kind of changes a little bit though. So the mobility dynamic. Um, and I think that that's probably um, also an important function um, and a consideration in addition to just good old fashioned, you know, kind of macroeconomics and that, you know, cost of capital up means, um, you know, the likelihood of transaction acti and activity um, goes down. It's just the inverse relationship. I, you know, I live in I live in Williamsburg. I live in um, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and still. You know, the, the average price, I think I, I saw this, but like roughly, I mean, roughly based on my understanding of the market, like you could go for like a one bedroom or something like that. You used to be able to find um, a one bedroom in Williamsburg for like 3000 bucks a month or something like that. 
Um, now it's really difficult, you know, to find that. And that's probably going to sound nuts for a lot of people. Now you literally, you can't find anywhere for like under 4,500. And I'm just like, who is a Ford? And, and, and not only, it hasn't cooled down. There's no inventory for that. As soon as someone thing pops on the market, there is bidding wars. Not, not to buy an apartment, to rent an apartment, wherein the rent price goes for 20. I mean, it's still like extremely overheated. So you kind of see that on the ground, albeit Williamsburg is probably not representative of the rest of the United States. Um, but at the same time, I'm watching mortgage rates tick up. I know they've, they, they, they were, uh, you know, a six handle for a little while. Now they're back down in the 5% range, but, um, you know, it doesn't seem like the housing market has cooled off at all. And I know a bunch of inventory has come online as well, right? Housing is just like any other cyclical industry. There's a, um, you know, as, as soon as demand ticks up, right? Supply, you know, rushes up to meet it. There's yeah, an response. oversupply and that's how you get right. Exactly. So maybe just the lag, you know, I, the, the lag is, is preventing the, the, the response, but like, I'm just, I'm very confused. Uh, yeah. I think, I think, I, I do think that the lag is, is probably the, the primary yeah. Um, explanation. I mean, it sort of is, you know, what, what do they say about monetary policy? It works with long and variable lags, right? I mean, and I think that that's true in the mortgage market. I mean, think about it. Mortgage rates, you know, they, they were rising a little in, into February, but they didn't really make their move until sort of March, April, right? And here we are in July. It's a couple months later. Um, I think it'll just take time to flow through. I think that's, I think that's the main part of it, in my opinion. I mean, I think let's see where we are uh, three months from now, right? So you give it like kind of a, a, a full six months of digestion. And I think um, that will happen. I mean, um, I just read a, a post from um, the Calculated Risk blog. Uh, that's the Twitter handle. I, mean, I think he does a great job on housing, um, but had a you, you know had a good summary of your know, kind of current state of the housing market. I sent it around on, on my Twitter. I, mm. I think you're seeing the housing market sort of normalize from overheated territory. And now it's kind of things are looking a little bit more quote unquote average. Uh, and I think from here, we probably start to see things that look a little bit below average. That would be yeah. that would be my guess. And I think it takes time. I mean, one of the points that I read from his post that I thought was was important because you you, you were asking about housing prices before, um, like the, the Case-Shiller home price index is a average of the previous three months prices. So, if you have a May report, that's averaging the prices from March, April, May closings, right? So think about how the the home price response that you're going to see. It's going to take time for that to actually visibly show up in the you know the index index data and the national price data that that we're all sort of following and watching. Um, and so that you know I think even the data will be you know a little bit slow to respond, even if the activity on the ground um, is changing. I guess just in closing here, maybe some some recommendations uh, going forward, right? Like especially over the course of the next twelve months, um, you know, it would have been hard if investors were looking for refuge, right? Over the last, uh, you know, basically since the start of the year, there weren't a whole lot of places that they could have found it outside of energy, right? So I guess um, you know, my my two part question for you is here, you know, as as a passive investor, most retail investors, mm -hmm. right? They have like their passive long only investors. So do they mm -hmm. have any options here other than just sitting in cash, which is <laughs> ironic in an inflation environment? Uh, and then and then two, I mean, do you think that this is, um, you know, what, what areas, if any, do you think are, are bright spots? Yeah. So look, I mean, my best advice at the moment is probably still to just, uh, you know, have a lot of patience. Don't, you know, I don't think there's any reason to like rush in. I think, you know, Markets are obviously down a lot. That's great if you raise cash early this year. I mean, we'll present um, a good opportunity to step into "quote unquote" good assets at um, you know otherwise bad prices. Um, but but I personally would prefer to see some um, clarity both on the part of the Fed's job, right, and and at what point do they kind of get a handle on the inflation situation because that will that will help to arrest, you know, a, a clear issue for the market uh, and a clear risk, you know, for the market around inflation and the speed of, of rate hikes. Um, my guess is that sometime in the September, you know, November timeframe, maybe we'll start to kind of get some, you know, we'll get a little bit more clarity on that. Uh, the other thing that I think is important to see is that we, we at least for me in my own framework, is that my growth leading indicators um, stop falling. Uh, I yeah. need to see a tick up. I mean, even if that tick up is 12 months from now, it's the kind of thing that gives you some um, 
uh, confidence that, uh, you, well, to back to your earlier point, the confidence that you can sort of buy dips as opposed to uh, risk catching a falling knife. So above all, I think stay defensive. I mean, I think if if you have the ability to um, to short stocks, which to your point, most retail investors don't, but you know, having a more balanced portfolio between longs and shorts, I think is appropriate. Um, I do like. I mean, there are some ETF you know products out there that are, that are I think are interesting. Um, there's like an anti beta ETF that I think the ticker is BTAL. Um, I have no affiliation with them, but I think it's a it's a it's a good product that basically gets you long, low beta stocks across all sectors and short high beta stocks across all sectors um, and it tracks the Dow Jones anti beta um, index that to me is is something that you know you would expect to work in the environment that we're in which is a way of of having you know kind of no directional market risk but your sort of long low beta stocks and short high beta stocks um, otherwise I, I mean I think some of the other things that are starting to get interesting for your know, retail oriented investors is you know muni uh, muni bonds um, for a lot of people I think start to get get interesting. I mean, particularly if you look at sort of like inside of 10 years, um, you know, you know, rates have come off a lot. Uh, and, I, you know, obviously there's still concerns around inflation, but, you know, triple tax free uh, rates, I think, are um, are interesting. And I would personally expect as we shift away from a focus on Fed rate hikes and towards one uh, and towards, you know, growth cuts and a market that's increasingly concerned about recession uh, and and a growth decline to be one where the correlation between rates and stocks starts to kind of go back in the other direction uh, in that we you know, have some normalization. Maybe we don't go all the way back to where we were, were before, uh, but that correlation uh, in the context of a diversified portfolio um, adds some benefit again um, that was not the case um, you know, six, nine months ago. All right, Mr. Blonde. Well, look, you've been really generous with your time um, already. Uh, Guys, uh, as, as you can tell, there's a lot of great analysis. Um, I, I find a lot of your information via Twitter, um, but you know what? What in addition to your kind of Twitter handle, um, if any? I mean, you, you produce a lot of great uh, blogs and a newsletter as well. What's the best way for folks to just um, find out more about you, follow you, consume some of the some of the analysis that you put out? Yeah, sure. Thanks. I mean, I mean, the Twitter handle is the easy go to place at Mr. Blonde underscore Macro. Uh, you can find me there. Uh, otherwise, uh, Substack. There's you know stuck in the middle. Is a Substack. I, I try to I try to update my thoughts there a few times a month, uh, and and the Twitter is more for the day to day observations and conversations that happen. Um, where Substack, you know, puts a little bit more meat on the bone um, and how I'm thinking about things and, and some trades that uh, that I find interesting. Absolutely. All right, Mr. Blonde. Thanks so much. Uh, we appreciate the analysis. Um, we'll see you next time. Great, Mike. Thank you. Cheers.